Okay, so let's go ahead and start talking about speciation <clears throat> in this process called macroevolution. So what I want you guys to do is go back to the previous lecture on process of evolution and how it occurs and pull that up and kind of walk through the procedure or the process here. So we talked about the five different factors that influence population genotypes. So big star here, five factors that influence it. We have mutations, genetic drift, gene flow, sexual selection, and natural selection. So make sure, boom, 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 can you list out those five and understand what they are. Now those factors, let me change color here, those factors all are going to help lead towards selection. Oh, wrong color. Let me get a... All right, so those five factors lead towards the selection idea we were discussing in the last lecture where we were talking about, all right, you got a population and it has this type of distribution and over time the distribution changes and over more time, more importantly, more generations, we see this continuous selection in one direction, what we call directional selection. Over time, if you keep saying your average is best, basically the center of the peak, you're stabilizing, or remember the double humped camel idea? This is what we call disruptive selection. That type, these types of processes all are working towards a thing known as speciation. Oh, that's bad. Let me fix that one. Sorry. The mouse writing is not an easy task, even after all these lectures. All right, speciation. All right, so speciation. That's what we want to look at, is what is speciation? So in order to understand speciation, we need to look at basically some definitions of what is a species. So here is a very challenging concept. If you Google, if you Google species, you pull up the dictionary definition, there are a bunch of different definitions for this word. What is the most accurate one? <clears throat> what is the correct one? What is the one that is most appropriate to use? That is a struggle and a challenge. All right, so <clears throat> one way to look at species is through this thing called the morphological concept. So morphological concept says you are the same species, basically if you have the same physical features. Same features equals same species. So these two butterflies are the same species morphologically because they both look pretty similar. They're very, very similar. That makes them the same species. Is that the best approach? Other ways to define species is through the evolutionary species concept. So, oh, sorry, went off screen there. This is based upon their evolutionary pathway. How did that particular species evolve as they went down the evolutionary pathway over the course of millions and <clears throat> millions of years? Is that a more accurate or more appropriate way to define species? Clean this up. There we go. Okay. Another option, phylogenetic. Do you share a common ancestor? Then you're going to be the same species. All right, so again, here's our challenge. Which term or which definition do we use? Because let's put it into a real life scenario. This animal is classified as an endangered species. Depending upon the definition of species, it may change the classification of that animal, the classification status. Okay, so again, we're looking at what's the best definition. Now, the most 
common definition, the one that's most often used, is the biological concept. And in order to be considered the same species with the biological concept, this is based upon the ability to mate and produce fertile young naturally. <clears throat> okay, so can you reproduce and have offspring? So we have our elk here doing the deed, going it down and reproducing. Those two animals are considered the same species if they can produce fertile young. If you cannot produce offspring, then we say, okay, you're not the same species. Now, it doesn't mean if there's one individual who is sterile, there are different species. But we look at populations. So if this population and a different population can get together to reproduce and they have fertile young, they're the same species. So the challenge here is, depending upon the definition being used, it changes sometimes the classification of that species. So if somebody was and give you just a real life example, not picking on anybody here, but oh, I want to develop a piece of land and turn it into subdivision or uh, real estate development, etc. And we do a species analysis. Are there any endangered species or threatened species on that property? Which definition do I use? Because as a developer, I don't want that to impede my potential ability to develop that land. And I might say, well, based on the evolutionary definition, that population of Kirtland water snakes, there's plenty of them. I can develop, and I'm not going to compromise a threatened species. But if somebody else came in and said, well, based on this definition of species, that population is not that big, it's an endangered species, we want to stop development. So it becomes a very, very difficult topic to work with. Biology-wise, we focus on the biological species concept. That is the primary one. There's also discussion right now, should we base the species definition upon genetic analysis, molecular data? Let's we'll see what the future brings with that. Okay, so now once speciation has occurred and you have your ancestral population here that's reproducing over time, and over time you start to see differences appear. And eventually that fork, as we call it, happens. So you had population A, and over time they change. Some of them evolve one direction into C, others go, I'm sorry, into B, others evolve into C, and you have what we consider two different species. Directional selection, disruptive selection, stabilizing selection, etc. That's what we're seeing here. Now the question becomes, well, how come C and B can't come back together and reform the original ancestral A population? Well, that's because in nature, there are things called isolating mechanisms. These are things that naturally prevent two different species from coming back together and reproducing. Please keep in mind, to go from A all the way to B and C took millions of years. It doesn't happen overnight. To go back, to take B and C and try to come back to A would also take millions of years. But isolating mechanisms prevent that. And they do it in two categories or two different ways. The first category is what's called prezygotic isolating mechanism. Oh. In a prezygotic isolating mechanism, this simply does not allow the zygote to form. So the majority of them basically block reproduction. If you can't reproduce, you can't have offspring. So there's no zygote even forming. All right? One of the simplest prezygotic isolating mechanisms is habitat isolation.
All right, different species live in different habitats. That's your isolating mechanism. So you look at the map here. We have a northern spotted owl that lives up here on the west coast of the United States, California, Washington, Oregon, a little bit into Canada. You have the Mexican spotted owl. That's the green coloration. Down here, Arizona, Nevada, Mexico, etc. Down here, they can't get together. Mexican spotted owls don't take a road trip up to northern California when it's breeding season. That'd be a long flight. So they are similar to each other. They have a similar ancestor or a common ancestor, but they're not coming back together to recreate the ancestral owl population because they simply live in different environments. Simple way of isolating your genetics. Now, sometimes though, populations do live in the same environment. Different species that have a common ancestor live in the same environment or their territories overlap. Habitat isolation doesn't prevent them from reproducing. What will often block that reproduction is a thing called temporal isolation. In temporal isolation, you have different breeding seasons. You are reproducing at a certain window of time during the year. So males are making sperm, females are making eggs. That's when your species says it's time to reproduce. The other species that lives in the same, in this case with these frogs, in the same pond, they are reproducing at a different time of the year. So let's look at just easy example. Bullfrog mating season. There's our bullfrogs. Starts usually early June, goes through mid-July. So when the bullfrogs are ready to reproduce, this wood frog over here has already gone through its breeding season. It's done. Females have no interest. They don't have eggs left. They're all done for the year. They've bred. Their breeding season is over, and there's no nothing triggering the wood frog to reproduce in June and July or the leopard frog, or the pickerel frog. They're all done with reproduction before the other frogs even begin. So that's why we don't have that crossover between things like wood frogs and leopard frogs, pickerel frogs, that group breeding with even the green frog or the bull frog. Different seasons. Now if you do look at the wood frog and the leopard frog and the pickerel, they overlap each other. Their breeding seasons actually overlap. So could those three frogs kind of mix it up? and a wood frog and a leopard frog get together? Possible, but our next isolating mechanism tends to block that. You have the same habitat, you have the same breeding season, but you have a different behavioral dance when it comes to breeding. Okay, this is what's known as behavioral isolation. So each of those frogs has a specific song they will sing, and the female recognizes that song, the female of that species. So the ability to sing and to sing a specific song is hardwired into that species. So the wood frog, his song for the male wood frog is different than what the leopard frog will sing. So when the wood frog is singing, it's like somebody singing in French, the leopard frog doesn't understand French. They understand Italian. They can't communicate. Even though they could reproduce at the same time, they can't communicate with each other and they're not going to interbreed and mix their genetics. So in the bird right here, this is what we call prairie chicken, uh, entertaining beyond belief. These guys, the males go out into the middle of the field, they do this little dance, and they're stomping their feet, and they're bouncing around, and the males bend over and they go, as loud as they can. Well, the turkeys sitting at the edge of the field look at them and think they're idiots because the turkeys don't understand that song. But the female prairie chickens like the males that are good dancers. So it's going to encourage the female prairie chicken to mate with the male and the turkey's going to ignore it. Behavioral isolation plays a big role in a lot of animals. Nothing to do. Plants don't do this at all. So in our next lecture, we're going to look at the last 
prezygotic isolating mechanism and talk about some others as well.